So we're back on Careers in Discovery, and this week I'm joined by Maud Tessier of Seismic Therapeutic. Maud, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me. Happy to be here. Oh, it's fantastic to see you. And Maud, I'm really excited to um, explore your career and talk about business development and science and, and machine learning and all the things that you've been involved in along the way. Um, we always start by talking a little bit about what you're up to now. Um, and I'm really excited to learn more about Seismic Therapeutic and how you uh, summarize yourselves as the machine learning immunology company. So maybe you could tell us a bit more about that. Absolutely. Um, so Seismic Therapeutic, we're a preclinical immunology company based mm -hmm. in Boston. Uh, we use machine learning to discover and develop novel protein therapeutics, both enzymes and antibodies for the treatment of autoimmune disease. Yeah. And we currently have uh, two programs in IND enabling studies. So we're almost in the clinic, which will be an exciting milestone for us as a mm. company. And we really, um, these two lead programs are novel approaches to validated targets in the autoimmunity space. Yes. So one of the two lead programs is a uh, pan IgG protease that we design using machine learning. So it's an enzyme that cleaves the autoantibodies that are responsible for autoimmune diseases like myasthenia gravis that you may have heard of through Arginex and other companies that have mm -hmm. made quite the splash in the last few years. The other lead program that we have is a PD-1 agonist. So a lot of folks have heard about the PD-1 antagonist space in the oncology yes. realm. So this is looking at the other side of the coin. And in this program, we have an antibody uh, that allows us to essentially engage both the T cell and the B cell side of the immune synapse. And we believe that's going to be meaningful for a number of T cell mediated autoimmune disease like rheumatoid arthritis, lupus, and other indications. So very exciting time for us as a company. Absolutely. And and what has been the sort of the difference that machine learning has made for for you in your development as a uh, and the development of your programs? So machine learning is a really exciting field. Of course, it's exploded in mm -hmm. the last few years. Um, when Seismic got started in 2021, most of the companies that were involved in machine learning and drug discovery were using AI for the purpose of identifying or validating molecular targets, or they were yes. using it for small molecule drug discovery. And so Seismic, we were one of the first wave of companies that were solely applying machine learning to biologics drug development. And so the way we're using it here at Seismic is that we are integrating machine learning with structural biology, translational immunology, and protein engineering. And machine learning allows us to essentially optimize multiple parameters at once in parallel in order to get to a final drug candidate much more quickly than mm -hmm. in traditional means. So with biologics drug discovery, typically you would make one mutation at a time to start from, let's say, an existing natural occurring enzyme or an existing antibody. And with each mutation, then test it in the lab and figure out what the effect of that mutation is. What machine learning allows us to do is to make multiple mutations in a single cycle and okay. looking at the effect of all these mutations on various parameters, like the stability of the molecule, the function of the molecule, as well as the immunogenicity of the molecule. And mm -hmm. so machine learning is really a helpful tool because it allows us to better understand the relationships that exist between the various amino acids that form a protein. And yes. so we can essentially change many of the different parameters that a protein needs to have to be more of a drug. Um, and we can get there much more quickly. Our first two lead programs went from discovery to um, development candidate in 18 months, which is about half of what it normally takes. Absolutely. Um, and in particular, here at Seismic, one of the, the key parameters that we've really um, have gone beyond state of the art uh, with machine learning is around this immunogenicity component. So as you may know, okay. as different proteins are engineered, it can create an immune response in the host because it's seen as a foreign entity. And so we've been able here at Seismic using machine learning to be able to predict both the T and the B cell epitopes within proteins and be able to remove them while still keeping the stability and the function of the protein. And so that's, a, I think, a, a key element of how we've used machine learning in a different way than others have so far. Yeah, very interesting. And as you say, you know, that's rapid progress. 
Um, but also, I suppose, being efficient with your programs, that's allowed you to advance two programs at the same time rather than having to pick one and um, and bet on just the one. Absolutely. Yeah, we over delivered on what we were looking to <laughs> achieve. And, uh, you know, Seismic really got started around a concept of applying machine learning to biologics. And a big portion of our team here at Seismic is um, have a track record in the immunology drug development space. And so that's where we're starting to develop mm. drugs in the autoimmune disease area. And obviously with with time that may uh, that may broaden, uh, yes. but that's where we're we're starting. And I think these two areas that we've picked to start with are really novel approaches to autoimmune disease validated targets. And so I think it's also allowing us to really clearly have examples of how we've used machine learning yes. and have those as case studies and proof of principles of how AI can help with drug development, which, um, you know, for us, I think was really important as a company to be able to, you know, crystallize for our audience, which obviously in my case, I'm mostly investors and, and pharma companies mm -hmm. about how we've used machine learning and how helpful it can it can actually be. Yeah, absolutely. And that leads me nicely to my next question about your role in the company, Maud. And um, as the chief business officer in this kind of company, um, I'm assuming that you're looking quite far ahead in the development of the business and developing those relationships for partnerships, licensing deals, that kind of stuff further down the line. But tell me, tell me a bit about where your focus is. Yeah, so currently at Seismic, we have about 50 people. So we're mm -hmm. still a fairly small company. And as I mentioned, we're about three years old. And so as the chief business officer, I really sit as this intersection of science and business, which is what I really enjoy about my role. Yes. And I'm accountable for um, strategizing around the financing and the partnering strategy for the company. And of course, executing on the strategy once we've, we've set it. And also building a number of business functions, including business development, but not limited to business okay. development. As I'm sure you've covered with others in your podcast, when you're a CBO of a small company, you get to wear many hats. <laughs> um, and uh, my team at Seismic is really a uh, incubation center, as I like to say, for a number of business functions. And so currently, in addition to the financing and the partnering, I'm also responsible for corporate communications, investor relations, as well as um, IP and contracts. And okay. so it's still a fairly broad remit. And fortunately for me, I have two talented team members and collectively we wear all these, these hats. And with time, I think there's always this organic evolution when um, eventually we'll hire some experts who can take over some of these functions for us. Some of these team members may kind of butt off and become their own leaders yes. and their own teams with time. And so that's always a, a, a nice moment where we get to that uh, that stage as a, as a company. And so for us, I think that's been, um, you know, the key remit of the CBO role here at Seismic. Yeah, fantastic. And that that blend of, of science and business and science and, and the commercial side of things is is what really excites you, you mentioned. And I want to come back to that as we talk about your career. Um, but we always like to go right back to the beginning to start with. Um, and I'd love to understand, you know, of course, you're a molecular biologist by training and uh, and and did your PhD at Toronto in, in molecular biology of cancer. Tell us a bit about for you why why science first of all and why biology why drug development where, where are the origins of this career for you? So I started really my my career as you pointed out in in the biochemistry biology space mm. and you know growing up in a small town outside of Montreal I uh, my dad was a teacher. Uh, he was also a university professor and he did a PhD in his 40s in humanities mm -hmm. uh, while he was working full time. And my mom works at a hospital. She was an imaging tech um, at a local hospital. And so I remember being a kid and kind of hearing, you know, my mom's kind of day when she got back home right. about all the interesting kind of medical cases that she's seen. And I would say this is when I got to know a little bit more around the life science track and how my original interest in that space probably started. And my dad was the only person I knew who had a PhD at the time. 
And yeah. so, you know, for me, I think this was my inspiration, I would say, probably looking back to, you know, combine this love of science and this love of medical science in particular with, you know, wanting to do a graduate degree in that mm -hmm. that area. And at the time, I didn't really know that it was going to, um, you know, lead to a career in drug development. I really thought that I was going to continue on the academic track and be a scientist and be a principal investigator and have my my own lab. That's what I thought at the time. And obviously, things have turned out differently in a good way. Sure. Um, but that was that was my original goal by doing a, a graduate uh, program was to become a, a scientist full time. Yeah, interesting. And as you say, things took a took a different turn at some point. And um, you you finished up your PhD and found yourself straight into the sort of business development commercial side of the industry. I'm really interested about how that happened, what the what drew your attention to that sort of things and, and how you ended up there. Yeah, absolutely. So when I was finishing my PhD, probably a year after I, I finished, I was thinking that I loved science and wanted to still be closely involved with the science, but did not want to be in the lab. And so I went on a bit of a career exploration back in Toronto where I was very proactive and just trying to find my own way. And that was very intimidating at the time because mm -hmm. this was a time, this was early 2000, not to date myself, but that was about 20 <laughs> years ago. Sure. And, and so things were different back then, especially in, in Canada, where things aren't quite the same as here in, in Boston from a life science or entrepreneurship standpoint. So... I really had to kind of put myself out there and um, I started by having a lot of informational interviews with various people who had found um, their path, if you will, by having had a mm. PhD, but by doing something different. I ended up doing an internship at the tech transfer office where I um, I was a student. I ended up taking a few MBA classes, not a full MBA, but a, a few classes here and there. Yeah. Um, and eventually find my way to wanting to do business development and licensing, partly because of the interdisciplinary nature of the work um, and because it was much more an outward facing role where one right. could see, you know, the impact of the work, uh, yeah. especially with obviously our goal of helping patients. And so while this was going on, I knew I was going to move to Boston as well. Um, so I met my husband in graduate school. Mm -hmm. <laughs> he, he was already here in Boston doing a postdoc, so I knew that was in the cards. And so when I arrived here in Boston, I think the challenge was that one, I was trying to make this transition without knowing anyone except my right. significant other. And uh, and of course I had no real business development experience mm. to speak of. And so what I ended up doing is essentially knocking on doors. So I printed out my resume and walked around Cambridge uh, here in Massachusetts and um, essentially showed up unannounced at a number of small okay. oncology companies. Yeah. And my strategy was to say, well, I'm trained as a scientist. I'm willing to work on the bench for a little bit. But my ultimate goal is to do business development and would love at least the opportunity of perhaps working on some business development projects on the side. And so and my pitch worked even better than I thought because <laughs> A few days after I showed up at a small company that was called Xanthus Pharmaceuticals, somebody called me back and said that the chief business officer was looking for a junior business development person that had a scientific background in oncology. And he was really, you know, I think keen on being a mentor. Yes. And he wanted me to come in and interview. And that's essentially how I got my first business development role. Yeah. And so definitely some of it is, you know, showing up at the right place at the right time. But I think, you know, there's definitely a lesson there about being proactive with one's one's career. Mm. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, sometimes, uh, as you say, it can be a bit of a a bit of a catch 22 that, you know, you need the deal sheet to get into BD, but you need the job to get the deal sheet. And people have to sometimes find a way around that. Right. Um, and I think. What's interesting is that, yes, OK, there's an element of serendipity in, in the story, but you put yourself in a position where that serendipity could happen. Right. Um, you know, and I'm sure it wasn't just the one company that you went and uh, dropped your resume off at. And I think, you know. A lot of people would hesitate to do that because 
they would be worried about being embarrassed or imposing on people or, or whatever it might be. But I, I think as someone who's sort of run sales teams and, and done a lot of business development, you'd see that as a really positive attribute for someone coming into a junior role, I think. Right. I do think my my boldness reflected well. Mm. <laughs> Absolutely. In the long run, right? Because obviously I wasn't going to take no for an answer and I was really committed to making this happen. And, um, you know, for me, I think that was a way of trying to accelerate it a little bit. Yeah. I do think with time, it probably would have happened, right? As I built my network more and more here in Boston, but it probably would have taken me months. And I'm not a patient person. <laughs> fair enough, fair enough. But I think, you know, the you, you'd move to a new city Obviously, you know, biotech hotbed, so there was clearly opportunity there, but but a new city nonetheless, and where you didn't really know anyone, as you said. Um, the sort of the the simple thing to do, the easy thing to do would have been to see if you could do a postdoc or to go and work in the lab somewhere or or you know, to sort of quietly work your way in and maybe harbor this ambition of getting into business development, but put it to one side for a while. And you seemed very you seemed very clear as you tell that story that you knew where you wanted to go with it though and that bd was the route for you where did that come from and why was that such a clear goal for you yeah i mean i would say in the last you know year after i graduated from my well before i graduated from my my phd while i was kind of finishing up experiments and writing up my thesis this is when I kind of explored a number of different career paths. Um, I read a really great book, which I'm assuming is still on Amazon somewhere, called uh, Leaving the Ivory Tower. Okay. And it, and it was one of these books where each chapter was essentially a you know personal story of someone that had a PhD but ended up doing a quote unquote alternative career in science. <laughs> yes. And that book was very helpful, and that was a time where again I had no role model to really model myself in so mm. I think for me this this book was really helpful and at least kind of narrowing down what sounded interesting to me and perhaps was less interesting and then from there it was really about cold calling cold emailing people within the Toronto area at the time and you know one of the lessons that I've learned is that people love talking about what they do for a living yes they do <laughs> <laughs> which is all why we're here on this podcast absolutely and um and, you know, the vast majority of people were very generous with their time and their advice and very, I think, also kind in wanting to help, you know, somebody that was trying to find their way. And, you know, for me, I think that was also a turning point in the sense that now that's also why I want to give back and continue to nurture this next generation of business leaders because, you know, somebody mm -hmm. did it for me at the time where I really, um, really needed it. And, you know, those informational interviews were really helpful to kind of narrow down the path towards business development and licensing. And I just thought that that was the kind of path that would really keep me fulfilled and entertained, <laughs> yeah. you know, yeah. for uh, the rest of, of my uh, my working life. You know, the fact that it's such a it's a demanding role because you need to know a lot about a lot of different disciplines. I think science is the start of it for mm. me. But you need to know about intellectual property, you need to understand contracts, you need to be able to negotiate. Um, there's obviously a lot of marketing involved. You know, how do you present the story to various audiences? And there's obviously a lot of soft skills involved mm -hmm. around how do you, you know, persuade someone? How do you influence someone? Um, and so for me, I think it was really exciting to have sort of the kind of career path that for somebody as curious as me, I think would would really keep me fulfilled and challenged. And, um, you know, almost 20 years later, it certainly has not disappointed. No, I'm sure. I'm sure. And I'm looking forward to hearing more about uh, how that unfolded. I guess the one thing I just wanted to ask before we moved on was about the strategy that you took and um, the the sort of the decision to do that because I think you know um again a lot of people would just apply for some jobs and if they didn't get them would sort of go okay well I guess they didn't get them um whereas you know you decided that there was a different approach to take what do you remember I know we're going back a while now but do you remember like why you when you decided to do that and why you made that decision what was it just an obvious thing to you or how did that come about do you think 
Yeah, I don't remember having had a lot of dilemma about this. Okay, I was sort enough. of like, <laughs> I mean, don't get me wrong, I did try the traditional route, yep. right? I did try to sort of apply for roles as they were posted online, just sending my resume in, right? Filling out whatever portal you needed to fill out. And it was pretty clear to me that probably a month or so into that strategy that that was not going to work. I see, okay. Um, so I would say that was the first kind of hint that maybe I needed to do something maybe a bit more extreme mm -hmm. uh, in order to get what I was looking for. Um, as I described earlier, I did have a bit of a, you know, sales pitch that I was flexible and, and was yes. okay with having me perhaps a bit more of a hybrid role at first, because I also, I think, was humble enough to understand that, that maybe I didn't have the background I needed yet, and I was going to have to be very lucky to find someone, my first business development mentor, who you know, I think saw something in me and was yes. willing to train me from the ground up. And so I think that was the other key element that I think it's um, it's very important to find early on in one's, one's career, especially if you're trying to make, you know, as big of a jump as what I was trying to do. Yeah, absolutely. And then, so I'm conscious we're still very much at the beginning of your career. <laughs> so you joined Xanthus, learned your, learned your craft there. Um, and then uh, and then progress through your BD career. You know, tell us a little bit about where it went from there. And I guess as well, you know, it sounds like a lot of the softer skills that you needed came naturally to you. But of course, you want to develop them and you want to refine them and you want to get better at the things you were really good at. So tell us a bit about your your growth as a, a business development professional. So I would say this transition from science to BD was the first phase looking back that right. I've had in my career. And I would say that since then, I've been able to kind of look at two other phases. I think the phase after that, which probably took a good decade, was around, as you, you, you described, developing these core business development and related skills. And I didn't have a very well-defined career plan. Mm. Um, I sort of, you know, just thought that this was an interesting path for me that was going to leverage a lot of my natural abilities and my love for science and my passion yes. for helping patients. And I was fortunate enough that along this 10-year decade, you know, or so, I was able to essentially own my skills in very different environments. So I worked in a small biotech called Xanthus, as you mentioned. Then I went to an academic medical center. So I worked on the academic side at Boston Children's Hospital for a number mm -hmm. of years doing IP, licensing, alliance management that's when i became a manager for the first time did a lot yes. of deals while i was there so a very formative time and then after that went to a large pharma company mm -hmm. and this was a time too i went at merck the american merck um here in boston and uh had a job in search and evaluation so my you know they paid me to learn about science every day for <laughs> uh, you know four years so that was terrific yeah. just meeting with a lot of very talented young companies and um, essentially trying to do a number of deals in that space to um, bring interesting scientific programs and novel drugs um, into the marketplace with uh, with the support of, of Merck. And that was a wonderful time as well. You know, I think I learned a lot about how large pharma companies do deals, how decisions are being made, how diligence is conducted. And I think this is also where a lot of the soft skills came into play, because as right. much as, you know, the large pharma side is considered the quote unquote buy side of our industry, mm -hmm. I would say that there's a lot of selling that happens behind right. the scenes. You know, you have to convince everyone internally that the deal that you're working on and the program that you're excited about um, is worth investing time and effort. And there's a lot of other programs you have to compete with when you're yeah. making that pitch. And so... For me, I think my time at Merck was also, I think, a very, looking back, a very formative time. And so, you know, after this kind of 10-year phase in academia, biotech, and pharma, um, I was fortunate enough to think of, you know, what's the area that for me makes the most sense to continue in. And um, after exploring that, I felt like being a small company executive was probably where my sweet spot was. Okay. I've enjoyed my time in these other settings. And as I've mentioned, I've learned something meaningful in every role I've had. And I've met yes. terrific people along the way that I'm still in, in contact with. 
Uh, but I really felt like being in a small company was the, the best path for me going forward. And so after this 10 year exploration, if you will, of BD in different environments, decided to focus on the biotech side. And I would say that's probably to date, you know, the third phase of my career. I'm in my mid 40s, so hopefully there's more phases to come. Absolutely. But, but uh, the third phase that I'm in now uh, has really been to kind of transition from an individual contributor in business development to being a C-level executive in a mm -hmm. small biotech. And that's been an interesting transition as well. Um, so I've been now a two-time CBO. Uh, yeah. So before Seismic, I was the chief business officer of Akena Oncology, which is a publicly traded oncology company here in the Boston area. And I joined them shortly after the Series A closed, and I was, um, I believe, employee number 13. Okay. And lucky 13, hopefully. <laughs> <laughs> And I stayed there until one year after we went public. So during that time, we underwent a lot of changes. There were a lot of ups and downs and twists and turns in our journey as a company. We became a clinical company. I did a very large um, cell gene deal, one of the last cell gene deals. Uh, right. then, then obviously worked with BMS. And there's a story there that we might get to eventually <laughs> as well. <laughs> And, you know, we bought a small company, we rebranded the company from uh, Kind Therapeutics, which was its original name to, to Ikenna, um, went public during the pandemic, which was an experience in itself, um, started out as a team of one, left when I had a team of six. So that was, I think, a very formative time for me because I realized that as much as I started out my career as a BD executive, now I mm. see myself as a company builder, first yes. and foremost. Business development is now, you know, an important facet, but only one facet of, of what I do here at Seismic and what I did at Akena. Yeah. And partnering is a, a core element of growing a successful company, but I would say my remit because of that, I think, has... Um, grown significantly in my interest after leaving Ikenna to essentially do the cycle again, hopefully, uh, here at Seismic was was part of that that bug, if you will. Mm -hmm. I think for me, the um, opportunity to grow an organization and have the common goal of helping patients with a group of really talented scientists and talented business leaders has, I would say, you know, no comparison in any other field. Yes. I think that's something that we're really fortunate to be able to do here in um, in biotech. Yeah, absolutely. And I think, you know, the the collaborative nature of the sector is really unique and it's, it's great to be able to um, just, I mean, there's so much fascinating science around, right? It's just, it's great to be able to see it and hear it and support it and partner with companies who are doing amazing things um i feel like i've got to ask you about the cell gene deal now <laughs> well this brings this brings us i think also to maybe something i've learned along the way about yes. what it takes to be a successful business development exactly. executive which is adaptability and resilience because mm. of course in a small biotech as i just described with our, our story at ikenna for instance the companies go through quite a few chapters and the ability of an executive to stay with said company for a certain amount of time is sort of almost directly tied to how flexible and adaptable someone could be. Yes. Um, you know, every six months, I sort of felt like my role was very different um, at Ikenna because, again, of this just, you know, maturation and growth of the company. And um, I think it also takes a lot of adaptability and resilience when surprises arise. Right. And in this case, you know, the cell gene deal was an interesting one because we were essentially parallel tracking. This was back in 2018 to set the stage. So this was a, a while ago. Um, and we were parallel tracking a Series B discussion with potential partnering discussions. Okay. And at the time, I was a team of one. So it was me and the CEO and everybody else was in R&D. Mm -hmm. And eventually, we had interest from both sides. And we decided to put, you know, our eggs in the partnering basket mm -hmm. uh, for a number of reasons. You know, one is that we we probably knew we wanted to pivot from an R&D standpoint. Um, and so that afforded us the opportunity of essentially finding a home for two of our assets 
um, and bringing in significant non-dilutive capital into the company in a way that the Series B would not have been able to, to provide yeah. for us at that time. So we picked the partnering path and Celgene was um, the company that we were furthest along with and eventually ended up discussing with them exclusively. And it was a pretty fast deal process. It was six weeks, you know, over the holidays. And so, you know, everybody was hard at work. And uh, the day before we were to sign the deal, this is when the Celgene acquisition by BMS was announced. I see. Okay. And so, you know, to this day, I would say that week <laughs> that started on that <laughs> fateful Thursday through um, the Friday that followed is probably, you know, the toughest one that I've had in my yeah. My BD career, um, you know, as a small company, we were highly dependent on getting this deal done in order cool. to have a long term viability. Um, we had picked that one path, as I described, and so we were fully committed to it and, and didn't have a whole lot of other options at that mm -hmm. point, at least near term, right? I'm sure longer term, we could have maybe figured it out and yeah. gone back to some of our Series B. Um, potential investors, but, you know, we were far down the path and, and there was a lot of pressure to getting this deal done. And so for me, I think this is one where, you know, being able to have a cool head during that time was very important. Obviously, there was a lot of panic when the news came in and we were getting, you know, pinged by the board about what does that mean for us? Is the deal still on? Is it not on? Um, so it was definitely a very, let's say, a stressful week. Um, and then the other kind of wrinkle is that, you know, JP Morgan, right, the healthcare conference uh, in San Francisco in January was starting that Monday. Oh, okay. And so, you know, we had originally planned that our deal was going to get announced and mm -hmm. we were going to have a celebratory time <laughs> in San Francisco. And instead, you know, my whole week was, of course, upended by you yeah. know, trying to close this deal um, as fast as possible and making sure that we still had enough enthusiasm on the Celgene slash BMS side to get that deal done after all. And that yeah. brought in $100 million into the company. And so that was a significant deal uh, that was just the upfront uh, for us to really support wow. the company for multiple years going forward. And so that time I was on the right side of that situation and that our deal got done, thank goodness. Um, but, um, but yeah, I think being able to think on your feet, being able to, you know, keep yourself within a certain emotional range is pretty mm -hmm. important. You know, you can't kind of be too excited or too negative, you know, I think trying to be sort of in this middle ground that allows you to be productive, even in times of high stress is definitely something that I've learned during that particular episode, but definitely yes. I think that I've taken with me for all the deals that I've done. Yeah, and I was interested to ask you about that, about how you react to that situation. So, you know, you've been working hard on this deal for a long time. You've kind of not maybe burnt your other bridges, but you've made those paths more difficult to go back to, to commit to this. Uh, I'm assuming they hadn't said anything about their situation because you don't, right? Um, and suddenly this news gets announced and not only does it put the deal in jeopardy? But I suppose everything you've learned about who the decision makers are, who the influencers are, what the financial status of the company is, what they're interested in, all this kind of stuff could potentially all be out the window and it could be a completely different, um, a different scenario. Um, what, yeah, what do you do when that happens? I mean, I think the first thing we did is, of course, call our current contacts at sure. Celgene. And um, I have to say the team that was there at the time, Rob um, Hirschberg, who was the former CSO and had just joined as the head of their business development team, was very good at making sure that um, we had open lines of communication, in particular that first day when the deal had just been announced, mm -hmm. uh, the merger had just been announced. And so that was definitely the first key part is to get, you know, a clearer understanding of the process going forward, how much our deal had been discussed and or not discussed, what the likelihood was that we could get it done. And I think we were fortunate in this particular case that, you know, when BMS acquired Celgene, quite a few members of the Celgene R&D team stayed on. Right, yes. And so because of that, there was actually quite a good level of continuity. And that became clear in the days that followed that 
the folks that we had who were true advocates for us at Akena and were really the champions of this deal and believed in our science, uh, the, the vast majority of them were going to stay on. And actually, quite a few members of the diligence team that had looked at the program and ended up being involved in the program longer term and being, being part of our joint steering committee. So the continuity on the R&D side was there for sure. On the BD side, a lot less, right? Once the acquisition went through, obviously some of those teams kind of got, got recycled. But um, on the R&D side, I think we were pretty fortunate that that was, that was something that worked in our favor. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And I, I think know. good communication with our board was also really important um, because, you know, there was a lot of discussions around, well, is it a good thing that BMS is not in a picture? <laughs> And, you know, the short answer was yes. I think we we felt like that was a, you know, for us longer term, I think a um, a good thing to have BMS as our partner. Um, yes. I think Celgene would have been terrific as well. But there was definitely some conversation along the way about not just if BMS still wants to do the deal, but do we as a small company want to move forward with this deal? Because yeah. that could have been up to us. We could have decided to walk away as well at that time, right? The deal was not signed. So yeah. we did have some of that discussion as well, but uh, the discussion ended up, of course, steering us towards getting the deal done and um, the collaboration went through, um, you know, the five years and clinical data was was generated and, um, you know, time, time will tell how that program turns out. No, absolutely. And you don't have to confirm or deny this, but I, I would suspect that there was at least of the board that's more money now <laughs> <laughs> yes definitely i think you know the one week in between the um the announcement of the merger and when we um actually got the deal signed uh, gave us a little bit more time and um yeah. we were able to maybe get a few things in there that uh you know we we were not able to get beforehand so i would say it it, it worked out well for us in in um in our favor that time around no, that's good. That's good. Um, and then so so seismic came next, of course, and uh, and has led on to where you are today. Um, and then looking back over, I suppose, your career to date um, from, you know, moving to be the years ago, working in biotech, working in an academic research group um, into big pharma, biotechs again, machine learning driven company. What if and you shared some of them already, but what have been the sort of other key career lessons do you think that you've taken from your experience over the years that you'd share with people? I would say for me, another learning was um, how to have the appropriate level of humility and confidence. Because I do think this is obviously a business that's very challenging. It's a high risk, high reward type of situation. You never know where the science is going to take you. Some of the science can be very exciting and may or may not work out. And yeah. so I think, you know, especially here at Seismic where we work on the immune system, you know, I think it's there's a humility there about knowing that we don't understand everything about how the immune system works. Mm -hmm. And for me, I think it's also that in my career, I've learned about business development along the way. Uh, we touched upon it earlier, you know, I along the way to not do an MBA. I still don't have one. <laughs> Probably never will at this point. Yeah. Um, but, you know, <laughs> I've, I've learned as I went along, if you will, and I'm still learning a lot, right? So I think every role that I've had, I've learned something about myself, but also something about the industry, something about, you know, a particular maybe realm that I had not yet been accountable for, you know, um, in my job at Akena, for instance, when we went public, we we needed a, a a warm body, if you will, to to write the business section of our S1. Right. And, you know, I decided that I could do it. I've never done it before. And, um, you know, we were able to successfully go through our, our IPO process. So I sort of mm -hmm. feel like every role that I have is really about being confident enough to volunteer and step up when you're needed to do certain things, but yet be humble enough to know that you don't know everything and you need to ask questions and um, that there's always more to learn. But that's a that's yeah. a that's sometimes a hard line to, to kind of walk between humility and confidence. But I think if you can blend both together, you can be a very successful executive. 
Yeah, absolutely. And you, you mentioned this earlier, and I, I do want to ask you a little bit more about it. The the step into that sea level position um, and sort of taking that broader perspective about the company as opposed to just what you're doing uh, or your division. People, I suppose, sometimes see it as a linear transition, but I think even when it is, it's it, it can be quite a big jump into that executive team um, in terms of what's expected of you and the level at which you have to operate and that kind of thing. So what, what have been your experiences of that and what advice might you making that step? Yeah, I mean, I would say for, for me, there's always been um, a desire to lead. And I think that's something that as a C-level right. executive, you do across the company. So you're responsible, of course, for your own remit um, at the end of the day, but um, you know my personal goals are the corporate goals, and so mm. it takes a while when you're going from an individual contributor to a C-level executive to, um, I think, start realizing that at the end of the day you're responsible for everything that happens here at the company, right? You and the other C-level executives, as corny as it sounds, uh, you know, you are all in this together. And right. that is the truth. And, um, you know, I think if you find great collaborators here at Seismic, we have a terrific, very diverse team. And I think we work very well together and bring our own perspectives to the table. And I think it makes us stronger as a as a team. You can accomplish a lot by having this enterprise leadership. You know, we have abilities to mentor people across the company. And I think that's very important. Um, and I do think that being an enterprise leader is how you can be very successful as a C-level executive. And so as much as you're responsible for business development or financing or whatever is mm -hmm. in your, your remit, I think I see my responsibility across the company. I'm here to enable the science at the end of the day, right? Like BD is a support function. The science is the way that right. we generate value. Science is the way that we were, we were going to help patients. And so... I'm here to enable the science. And so for me, that also means mentoring scientists um, as needed mm -hmm. here at the company. And that's something that I, I really enjoy. And I would say, you know, uh, I read an interesting book as well when I was transitioning from being an individual contributor to a, a C-level executive. Um, I think it's called something like What Got You Here Won't Get You There um, by Marshall yeah, yeah, Goldsmith. Yeah, I, I think it's a fairly classic management mm -hmm. uh, type book. And uh, that one was really helpful because I, I did have to let go of certain things that maybe made me a very successful individual yes. contributor to become a successful C-level executive. You know, I can no longer be involved in everything. I can't do everything myself. Um, so, you know, there needs to be trust. Um, there needs to be delegation, you know, to members of, of my team um, in order for them to execute. And my job now is really to um, engage them, motivate them. There's still obviously a few things that I <laughs> continue to do myself. But, um, you know, it's a very different flavor of leadership when you're um, at the sea level versus um, an individual contributor. Yes. Yeah, of course. And I think you're right. I think it's that's the most challenging part is leaving those bits behind that have made you successful, right? Because there's a lot of, um, often a lot of anxiety associated with moving away from those things because they are the things that have got you where you where you are. Um, so it can be a real challenge. Yeah, I see myself much more now as, a, I would say, a sounding board, a cheerleader, right? I can mm -hmm. be who my team wants me to be. Yeah. <laughs> I think this goes back to this adaptability comment we discussed earlier as well. I do think that um, you have to be able to recognize what various people need, whether they're in your team or across the company, in order to be successful. And that might look different depending on who that person is, depending on their background, the stage of their career that they're at. And so, um, you know, I think depending on what they, they need, I can definitely adapt and, and be there for them in any way that is needed. Yes. And so this may be something you've already touched on, but if you were to give one piece of advice to, to a young Maud, perhaps leaving Toronto and coming down to Boston, you know, one thing that maybe you know now that you wish you knew then, what would that be? 
I, mean, I think there's a couple of them that we touched upon that we can expand on a little bit more. Um, the first one mm -hmm. is definitely around creating opportunities for yourself. You know, we've talked about yes. how I landed my first BD um, gig, and I think being proactive about your career is is key. Um, you know, you can definitely, I think, manage to make transitions in your career and maybe have opportunities come your way that would not have happened otherwise. And I think there's also an opportunity there to be open-minded because you're putting yourself out there. There might actually yeah. be opportunities that come up that you hadn't planned for that might be better path for you. And so for me, I think I had always a longer term goal of being a business development executive in a high science kind of environment, as we talked about. But it's not as if I had a very specific career plan in terms of the sequence of steps I was going to take and what kind of organizations I was going to be a part of. And in some ways, not having a plan was a positive. <laughs> so, yeah. you know, I think sometimes <laughs> we get too too caught up in trying to plan everything and then we miss out on some opportunities. And so um, yeah. that would be my first piece of advice. Yeah, no, that's fantastic. And the second one is also probably around networking. I mean, I think okay. for any role, uh, but especially in business development, networking is key. And as a scientist, originally, I think most of us are introverts. And so the thought of doing networking is not something that most people are excited about. <laughs> However, <laughs> True. However, one can train themselves to get to that point. I would say that with, with time, 20 years in, I'm sort of halfway now between the extrovert to introvert spectrum. And um, mm -hmm. some of it is finding what works for you and being self-aware enough to know that, let's say, if you've been on a conference for two days and you need two hours uh, on your own in your hotel room to recharge, then that's okay. Um, you know, if you want to get to know people through volunteering, which is what I've done a lot of um, in my career, you know, I volunteered for MassBio, for instance, for a number mm -hmm. of years. That's a way of networking, right? You get to know different people that aren't necessarily in your sphere on a day-to-day -day basis. And um, you get to know them while actually doing something together, whether it's organizing a conference, a panel discussion, um, you know, a cocktail hour, whatever it is, and you get to know people that way. So, so I think there's definitely ways that even if you're more of an introvert, you can learn to leverage networking in a good way and perhaps even learn to enjoy it <laughs> as yes, time goes yes. on. Exactly. Or at least pretend. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> well, more, and actually, been... there's another book I read that was called, um, I think it was called something like, you know, networking for people who hate networking. Oh, okay. And I'm sure there's different variations on that. But, um, you know, for a scientist that, you know, likes data and likes information, um, I've learned a lot of books along the way. And again, some of these hopefully will be helpful reading recommendations for your your audience. Absolutely. Uh, that one sounds good. I'm going to pick that one up myself. <laughs> well, Maud, it's been fantastic to speak to you. Thank you so much for sharing your story and uh, I've really enjoyed it. Thank you for coming on. Thank you so much. It's been uh, It's been a lot of fun to reminisce about the career path so far and look forward to the future. <laughs>